I'm Tisera, I'm a postdoc at the University of Toronto. Um, we're going to talk about identifying wetlife in the worst condition ever, in the, the noisiest of the noisiest environments, which is the city, where you have lots of people and lots of dogs and lots of squirrels, which are also wildlife, but we'll go on. Um, so research in urban wildlife um, has exp has expanded in the last uh, few years, um, and many of the cities collecting uh, and many of the cities collecting data on urban wildlife have come together to try to create a network that will eventually um, create papers on multi city comparisons. This is the UN network, and it has forty one cities, and it it has gone from ten or fifteen in the last. 34 years to 41. So that's how much researchers are now putting camera traps in city. And of course, this comes with a lot of data and a lot of data handling. Um, and most of them are collecting camera traps. So when it comes to data relevant to AI, most of them, we're all collecting camera traps and we're slowly expanding into audio maps and maybe even more data. The important thing is that you have a group of research across the globe that is collecting comparable data with the same sampling design in a way that it can be used together. This data is then used to, to work on studies that are relevant to human wildlife conflict, to epidemiology, and to species interactions in a very disturbed environment, which serves as a model for other fragmented environments. I lead the camera trap um, collection group at the University of Toronto. This is a collaboration between two, two labs, um, the Fertin and the Molnar's lab. They both have put camera traps and we have around 40 sites across, across Toronto. And we're using this data to, to investigate prey predator communities, to investigate the, where are the, 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 the rest of our animals, for example, now deer. Um, the spread of human borne disease parasites that can be spread from wildlife to dogs to people, and any disruptions in the carnivore dynamics. So, coyotes, foxes, they're a big focus in our research. So, this came with a lot of data. We collected around 1 million and a half photos in one year, and we have still another year coming that is already ending this summer. And so far, our pipeline has been collected data and then send it to Dan Morris. Dan Morris sends us a JSON file. <laughs> and then we, <laughs> yes, the life saver. We started with Camelot. It was horrible, it was super slow, 50 pictures per, per broad. You have to go one by one. We didn't have founding boxes. We didn't have anything. And we went from that to be able to say, okay, show me only the canids. And then we would recognize dogs, folks, and coyotes. But the issue is that this is a classifier that has been done in Idaho. So the mega detector work, works great. It's all the people super accurately, all the empties, except a few leaves here and there. Um, and then the classifier was made for Idaho. So we have the problem that we're outside of their domain. So we have our species of interest, which are coyotes and foxes are inside the canids, and many other of the small mammals, basically, the urban wildlife is small mammals, like opossums, raccoons, I forgot to add that, like opossums, raccoons, and um, groundhogs that we don't have many skunks. They're all grouped inside the small mammals that are together with squirrels. So obviously it's much faster than without bounding boxes, but it is still super slow. Um, so then these labels go, these predicted labels, the pictures with the predicted labels go through the Oracle, which I like the name, so I'm using it now. And uh, it's just people. Yeah. <laughs> I know. But it sounds so fancy. <laughs> and then we put through labels, mostly through labels. Um, and that's the pipeline so far. So the aim of me being here was to create an urban thesis classifier that was useful across cities. Of course, we cannot start with across cities. We started with one with Toronto. Um, but ultimately, we have all these people collecting camera trap data that aren't even classifying their, their, their data. And they're relying on volunteers. And it's a lot of work and a lot of time that could be spent doing research. Um, so the data that, that I came with was the data of Toronto and the data from the UN, which are 10 cities. There are 41 cities. Hopefully, later on, we can we can expand, um, but for the model, I used the University of Toronto. 
And uh, first we, need to, we needed to clean that data. We had the labels, we had the true labels, the ones that we had um, classified with the Oracle. Um, and we had, so we have the COCO format that had the bounding boxes and we had the CSV that came from time-lapse that had no bounding boxes, but had the true label. So I needed to combine these two and that's where I spent most of the time doing. But I wanted it to be that right. I wanted to get it right. First of all, because I was also learning Python as I went. And also because I knew that the future pictures were not going to be cropped, which I learned that that's not the case. I've done it. But I wanted to be able to get um, pictures and just crop them and get them ready to, to train further the model later. Um, so that's it. We got our cropped. Um, and then we had to split the data. So we tried, well, I tried three different things. One was uh, get training, testing, and validation from each of the sites. The other one that I tried was um, get training, validation, and testing data from different sites and also run them. And they all worked the same. It was it, it didn't make a big difference in this case, like very slick. But it, but the first wall that we found was the noise in the data. So I came, so my first processing of the data was done basically coding for, okay, I want all the bounding boxes, one bounding box per image because we had bounding boxes, but the label was image level label. Um, so I want all the bounding boxes that are over 60% confidence interval and then match this to the true label that was uh, recognized by the human. And when I did this 60% confidence, there was a lot of noise in the dogs. So at the beginning, the model wasn't performing well. And then I noticed there was there were a lot of cars in the dogs. There were a lot of pigeons in the squirrel. Mm -hmm. So the classes that we had the most were the hardest to check. Mm -hmm. And that's, and after I fixed that, so basically I recoded the thing. I changed it to give me the bounding boxes that have 80% confidence interval and match that to the label. That performed better, but I also went there manually and just fixed it a little bit. Um, so when there was noise, then we did find a difference in the random versus site dependent splitting because the noise was very site dependent. There were some sites that had more noise than others. So when we were selecting randomly the pictures, it was selecting across. But when we were, when we were doing the split location dependent, we were basically pushing in noise more than we would have if we had selected randomly. So that's the only time where I found that the splitting made a difference with this thing. Um, the second wall that I found was the imbalanced data. We had so many squirrels and so many dogs, and that made a difference. So basically the model accuracy was 99%, but it was basically dogs and squirrels. Um, so I applied two things, which was curriculum learning. So basically you run 100 pictures for the first IP box and 100 for the second, and so forth incre incrementally, and then we stopped at 2,000. So for the last epoch and beyond, so from, I don't know, Okay, on the map. From 20 to 200 to 200 ebooks, it was 2,000 images every time randomly selected a prop. So that was that was the maximum number of examples in that epoch. For yes. Class. Yes. Um, and that helped a lot. That really helped a lot. And we also fixed the loss weights based on the frequency of like how many animals, how many pictures we had per class. That also helped. Um, I'm guessing this is going to get better when we have like. 2,000 opossums and not 400 because then we have the same number of um, So the model worked really nicely. Um, these are the parameters I used. I used batch size 128, which was super fast. Eight workers, which was too beyond the limit of the, of the thing. Um, the learning rate and the way to get in and play with those. Um, the number of epochs I found out yesterday that you have to choose the best number. I was just running 200 by default. But I mean, you see how it was working. It was always incrementally getting better until it's worked out. So I think you could train that longer. Yeah, probably, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll try that next. 300? Well, just just put a thousand and then keep checkpoints and then just take the one that's best. Okay. Okay. I'll try that next. Um, and I also try image size and I increased by double the image size and it actually made the model worse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Probably because we have crops already, and some crops were really tiny and they were expanding. It had to upsample them a lot, and then they got really weird. Yes. Um, so that's it for the parameters. These were the results in terms of training. The, the classes that had few pictures obviously did for 
but the other ones were quite good in the training. And then when we validate, we see the same thing. They were they were okay. I mean, eighty percent, seventy percent, the truly goal. So, dog and squirrels were obviously almost perfect. <laughs> um, Coyotes were 90% accuracy, which was quite good. Um, and also raccoon and skunk were 80%, which I was happy with that. If we look at the class dependent uh, precision recall uh, graphs, you can see the coyotes and, and raccoons <coughs> really well. And then we have opossums that did horribly, but of course we had a low training data set and they're, they're always kind of blurry. And they're the same, the same, they're kind of light gray. So they, I don't know, they look like background, like blurred background. So we, I think we need more pictures of that. Um, the other one was foxes that we had around the same number of pictures of the coyotes, but foxes are like, they all, they're always spitting around. So when you see them in the camera, they're always like, and they're super blurry. <laughs> so, so, I mean, I think we need a bigger uh, training data set for that. Um, skunks, even though we didn't have too many, it was really good, but because they're also very distinct, actually, there was a breed of dogs that was recognized as skunk very often. And another breed that was recognized as deer very often. I mean, breeds are deer. And groundhog here, which some people call them woodchuck. I don't know if they're the same animal or not, but um, we didn't have enough. We have four pictures. I mean, we didn't even have enough data for those. Why, why was it even there? I don't know. I guess I was just trying everything. <laughs> so keep it simple. So if I have to run this again, I'm going to start just cleaning some of the classes that we have. Learning from grants. Uh, now this, when we run the test, the precision, so Benny didn't want me to look at the test, but for the sake of this presentation, if we were to use... You are actually allowed to look at it eventually. <laughs> if we were to use it tomorrow, I just ran it across my second year data. Um, the test looked better for the foxes. Well, I don't know if it's a matter of just how many pictures there were, just a um, random factor. And the opossum looked worse. Yeah. So, okay, is there hope for the opossum? I don't know, we'll try. <laughs> So there's so after we run, we see the nice graphs. I wanted to see, okay, what are the pictures? What if, what is the picture that is being predicted as what? So we coded with the help of Benny. We coded um, basically. We told the model, okay, just print all the all the pictures that are that you think are deer on this folder, and all the ones that you think are square on this folder, so we could see whether they were past. And you see already. I don't know if Okay, the, the fox there is facing front. It was recognized as a deer. And that is very likely because all the pictures that we have of an animal looking at the camera are deer because they're exactly at the size of the camera. Usually they're walking across the trail. They don't go with, I don't know. Um, and then some were quite obvious. I mean, this is a dog, a dog with a tail here. It was recognized as a squirrel. And this one, this is a dog, but it's also a squirrel. <laughs> Can you blame the model? Can you really blame the model? I can't. Um, the, nice, the nice part of the model is that it recognized my mistake. Um, so this, these were all inside the dog category, and I totally missed them when I was cleaning the data, and it recognized the coyote, a fox, and a squirrel. It actually recognized the wrong labels. So that is a good hint that we have something wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is, so basically if we were running this, so this is the test evaluation and the, the numbers are quite good. So I'm guessing this is going to get better as we train it. I am not taking this model. This is not the parameters that I'm going to use. I'm going to keep switching. There was no time for that. But <laughs> also my virtual machine crashed yesterday and didn't turn on until today. That's why Benjamin was trying to get the thing running. 24, so luckily my, my presentation was ready on Wednesday. Because otherwise I would have been there. Um, okay, so the next step is to get the, U, the data UN has given me and include it in the model, potentially just keeping the most common species to start with and then slowly incrementally um, teaching the model the other side. They have a lot of the ones that are really rare. So when we put them together, instead of having 400 or 200 opossums, then we're going to have like a thousand and then it's better. 
The second one, the second step is like, if these classes are still performing poorly is to try augmentation um, steps, try to fiddle up with the, fiddle with the model a little more. And then the, the last step is to include the meta detector into the model pipeline because I don't want to have to crop every single image separately. I just want to put them all and just get something out. So the, the final and ultimate aspirational pipeline will be that the pictures run through the YOLO architecture with the meta detector weights. They go into the urban classifier. I already gave it a name. Um, and then we get finally labels that are within our domain within that are a little bit more accurate. Um, and they're still going to be run by people because, because that's who we are, ecologists, um, but it's going to be much faster. And then when we have the true labels, then retrain the model and just keep it coming because this is a, a constant influx of data and a long-term research from all these cities. So, so hopefully at a certain point we can say, okay, let's stop tracking this. Or, or when a new city comes, we can retrain it with that data, and then they have more accurate. Once you set up a really good system, all you have to do to retrain is set up like hit go. So okay. like, the whole thing. Once that cycle is really easy, it's not so hard to retrain. That's a, okay. Then we can go into. That. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like that. Um, so thank you for everyone here at the at the summer school, especially ones that helped me with the code. Uh, Benjamin, you're a freaking genius. <laughs> <laughs> you're a man detector. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. um, and especially Catherine, Ethan, and Casey that helped me out with the code too. Like I wouldn't have results probably if they weren't so nice to, to help out. Um, the people at the UN that are um, contributing with data and helping with the data processing, and the people at the University of Toronto that are Thank you very much. Thank you to <laughs>
the model was just like learning things in the background. So do you have like certain species like woodchucks or coyotes that are like only appearing at one site in your so data? for the model that we classify right now, we have only crops. So that's easy. Uh, but when we get the meta detector images, we can at least um, recognize the space. I think I once I had a, a fire a fire hydrant that I had to just move the camera because it was always being recognized. <laughs> <laughs> Enormous yellow thing. And I, I showed you, but I'll show you again that you have more Python. We have code for removing repeated false positives in the mega detector code base. So and you can run it on a camera trap and it looks for things that are the same over time. And then it lets you as a human say, all of that is a fire hydrant. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's like post-processing. It's nothing fancy. It's literally just looking at box repetitiveness, but it's very, very useful for that. Yeah. That's we have the same problem with bait, like the things people put up for yes. bait. Um, they get detected all the time as false positives. Yes, that's really. I have to make a note before I forget. <laughs> yeah. How do you plan to hosting and server the model for all the speed? Yeah. Um, what do you think that is the best way to server a model for a camera trap that that is a lot of, of images? that sometimes it's difficult to go to a server. Yes, yes. That was something I was thinking with the with the other, with Amanda at you, and <laughs> we're thinking maybe it would be even easier to just run the mega detector and get the crops, because the crops are lighter and work on that, at least for, for the training data set. But we will definitely have to come up with maybe some type of deployment for the people at the UN that they can use it. Um, yeah, I haven't thought about the deployment part so far <laughs> it's um there it's hard um if you're in a really low bandwidth area uh, I, I am in that yeah area. yeah exactly either you just have to wait and do really slow upload and it's still with even really slow upload and processing the model the data through a model in the cloud will probably still be faster than the number of like human hours it would take because you just at least a human doesn't have to like sit and stare at the upload while it's happening would it make sense to have one sentinel and just go through the cameras with the sentinel connected and make it run? Or does it work with the, the sentinel oh, with the machine learn? Oh no, because that's that's um really small, like on device machine oh. learning. I don't know if the model will be able to process it that. But you but honestly, if you're a city as part of UN, you could buy a V100 GPU for like a thousand dollars. You just have a GPU that lives on a machine in your city and you just do the processing locally. There's an organization in Australia where they have a similar thing where they have all of these different national parks across Australia and they're starting to just look at having local GPUs and you work because they're processing that volume of data. Yeah, so it's everything. In, I mean, in the grand order of things, $1,000 for a GPU is really not mm -hmm. that big of an act. Especially if you compare it with the cost of the virtual machine. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. labor. Human labor, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So I, I, I think more and more that it's a question of like, then if you make model updates, how do you ship those model updates to all these GPUs? It becomes like a systems problem. But, yeah. Uh, maybe one more question? Yeah, Chris. Um, I was wondering, uh, like, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't remember if you said you trained your urban classifier from scratch or if that was like transfer learning from like a pre-trained like mega classifier? Or I did not change the model, the dot PT, Benji, yeah. I didn't, I know I used, I managed to use the mega detector model on the YOLO, so I know what you mean. So, but I don't remember using a, was it pre-trained? It was ImageNet. It was, it, that's the pre-trained model? Yeah. Oh, that's mm -hmm. why it runs so well. <laughs> <laughs> but you could, but you could probably actually potentially use the Idaho model as a training. That's a good point, yeah. Yeah, because it works way better for cats and for rabbits. Or you could ensemble the two. Take the Idaho model, take your model. Awesome. Yeah.